So I examine what it means to be post-Soviet as it is reflected in literature, uh, how authors from the post-Soviet region, in particular from the Caucasus and Central Asia, deal with this question. And you will see that throughout the talk, I will be drawing some examples, uh, mainly from literature. Um, and another argument that I propose is, it is uh, quite impossible to further develop the field of Russian post-colonial studies uh, if we neglect uh, literature, since after all, the post-colonial theory, the way it was of course formed, was very much um, with the study and the critiques of literary texts. So in the first part of uh, the talk, uh, I will focus more on theory. So it will be more uh, dealing with the methodological aspects uh, and some uh, pitfalls and some benefits of the current applications of post-colonial theory. And then in part two, uh, I will put this uh, theory, some of the theories that I mentioned, such as Orientalism, um, post-colonial theories around immigration, around neocolonialism, into practice. So I will be, be giving you some examples of how I personally have uh, used these concepts to approach uh, the developments in post-Soviet literature. Uh, so to give an overview uh, of Russian postcolonial studies as a field, it is relatively new. Uh, so for example, I also have a background in French. Uh, I did my master's in Francophone studies. And in the UK, which is where I'm ba based, if you uh, study French or Spanish or English uh, at the university, you have a very wide choice to take modules in francophone, hispanophone, anglophone studies, and to go beyond the metropolis uh, of the language that you are studying. And this is what I did. I specialized in francophone cultures, and um, this is where my interest in postcolonial theory really deepened. And I began to wonder why we don't really have the equivalent in Russian studies of having uh, Russophone studies, for example, where you can study authors who write in Russia but are not based in Russia, are outside of it, for example, uh, authors from Georgia, Armenia, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, and, and so on. Um, also, the main approach in Russian postcolonial studies is through a sociological and political lens. Again, uh, literature is under the shadow, uh, and this has to be redressed, I would argue. Uh, main focus is on Russia, again, uh, on whether Russia was a postcolonial state uh, and the perspectives of the countries that used to be part of the uh, of, of Imperial Russia and then later the Soviet Union are uh, more neglected, especially when it comes to the Caucasus and Central Asia. And so the question is, how do we integrate the study of cultures from the former Soviet Union in the, into this, this broader trend? So this, there's this increasing trend uh, in Russian studies to make it more transnational. There's a greater awareness of the varied perspectives on the Soviet and post-Soviet experience. So I would argue that looking at literature is a wonderful way of doing that because it helps us to take an interdisciplinary approach as I mentioned before. So some benefits, some uh, broadly speaking, uh, that we could uh, say about Russian post-colonial studies is that uh, since the Cold War, uh, post-communist countries still remain somewhat in relative isolation. So integrating the perspectives of these countries into the broader post-colonial dialogue would be one way of integrating their voices into the global dialogue. Um, also, uh, Russian postcolonial studies would redress this focus that I mentioned on mainly Russia, uh, and we don't know too much about what happens beyond. It would integrate literary and other uh, approaches, interdisciplinary approaches. It would help us to um, understand what, what exactly is meant by post, so beyond simple periodization. Um, also, uh, it not only introducing postcolonial in Russian studies not only enriches Russian studies, but in turn enriches postcolonial theory itself. Uh, 
Of course, post-colonial theory does not apply directly to Russian studies. Uh, and we need to rethink the very theory of post-colonial field itself and what the socialist model, uh, of course, it is based on the Western capitalist model of domination. And then we can ask what the socialist model can introduce to this current understanding. Um, so another benefit would be uh, to um, unsettle the East-West division. So the current understanding is that the West produced its history in the way that it dominates the rest of the world and there is this binary division between the East and the West. But this neglects the idea that Russia itself uh, had a great effort to produce the history of its own, one that unsettles this binary division of the East and the West. And finally, we can also rethink uh, the division of the world into uh, the three worlds, the, the capitalist develop, the developed world, the second world, and the developing world. Uh, again, the Soviet Union unsettles this equation since, uh, after all, for example, after the dissolution, after the 1980, uh, 1990s period, uh, many post-Soviet countries became synonymous with underdevelopment. So it's very tricky to place them either in the second world category or the third world category. So what about calling the post-Soviet space as the new uh, Eurasia? This has been suggested by some critics such as uh, Hagen and Sushland. Um, so they argue that, uh, that this term new Eurasia would highlight the uniqueness of the, of the socialist uh, experience. But I would argue that there are some pitfalls to this. Um, because it, this approach reinforces the connection between uh, Eurasia and socialism and therefore risks further isolating these states within the discursive field of socialism. And I would, I would argue that socialism, uh, the way it developed in the Soviet Union, cannot be understood without the context of uh, colonialism. Also, the term Eurasia remains an indeterminate, uh, politically totalizing and potentially homogenizing category with a relatively muddy history. Uh, like the umbrella term post-Soviet, which we're trying to move away from, uh, this neutral term glosses over the inequalities uh, and the persisting power imbalances that exist in the post-Soviet space. Uh, of course, the terms colonized and colonizer are not ideal either because they are very binary and we want to move away from those as well. However, we cannot do so completely because sometimes it is important to strategically employ these terms in Russian studies in order not to completely blur the distinctions between the so-called oppressor and the oppressed. So these terms, I would argue, are still necessary in Russian studies and need to be employed uh, strategically. But what if post-colonial theory in its current case does not fit uh, the post-Soviet uh, experience? And of course, I would argue that this is true. We cannot uh, simply pluck theories out of the Western uh, post-colonial theory, the way it developed in the West and applied to the Soviet space. But there is a school of thought, for example, by the leading uh, post-colonial critics, uh, Gayatri Spivak, that uh, rather than uh, looking at the theory as a rigid tool, and then applied to primary material, we should instead examine the theory itself. So it links back to this idea uh, that I suggested that we actually need to examine the post-colonial theory itself and uh, introduce some um, alternative post-socialist perspectives within its hermeneutics. So uh, post post Russian post-colonial studies, this is not a completely new field, uh, even though I mentioned that it's not as developed as Francophone and Hispanophone studies. It, is, uh, it contains some very important uh, studies, studies that are invaluable for the development of Russian post-colonial studies. And these early studies build on uh, Edward Said's famous uh, study on Orientalism, 
Uh, and uh, they argue that um, Russia, much like the West, constructed its own Orient, uh, namely in the Caucasus uh, and Central Asia, to define its own identity. But of course, some of uh, the issues, um, inevitable issues with such studies is that they do not go beyond the Russian perspective. And they also mainly focus on the 19th century where the Orientalist uh, quest was at its peak. Uh, so all the famous authors, Tolstoy, Pushkin, Lermontov, uh, they traveled to the Caucasus as part of the Imperial project and they wrote uh, studies on it and the literary works on this. But also we need to go beyond Edward Said, especially with recent developments, uh, uh, some very different theories in Latin American studies, for example, that we can also probe uh, Baba, Spivak, um, and uh, we need to examine other other theories aside from Said. So there is um, the way that Russian postcolonial studies developed initially was uh, that critics would focus mostly on Russia. And this is not surprising, partly because uh, there was an underrepresentation of scholars uh, from the form of Soviet states, for example, from the Caucasus of Central Asia in the universities of the metropolis or Western universities where the voices could be heard. So there was a trend that post-colonial theory was mostly initially applied to examine Russia's own uh, post-colonial identity. So what happened then uh, due to this? So, so this discourse of Russian Orientalism, I would argue, has been appropriated by critics talking about Russia's supposed internalized and self-orientalized identity. So there is this paradox that while um, few scholars employ the term post-colonial to refer to the Caucasus or Central Asia, it is very acceptable to talk of Russia in these terms. So Russia is a post-colonial country, Russia is an internally colonized country and a subaltern country, some would also argue. So on the one hand, these studies again, like studies on Russian Orientalism are extremely valuable. Uh, because they illuminate the ambiguities of the Russian uh, imperial case. Uh, they also uh, fill important research gaps. So when we talk about internal colonization, it is very useful to talk of how people in Siberia, for example, were su subjected and how it differed from how Russian, Russians proper uh, their experiences in the Russian empire. Um, but this commendable endeavor of incorporating Russian studies in the post-colonial sphere is je jeopardized by the general lack of critical attention to the question of race. There is one important exception here, which is a study by Marina Mogilne. Uh, it's called Homo Imperi, a history of physical anthropology in Russia. Uh, and uh, Mogilna talks about racial science in pre-revolutionary Russia and the early Soviet Union. And she revises the widely assumed view that the supposedly non-classical and um, uh, non-classical nature of the Russian empire and its equally non-classical modernity made Russian intellectuals immune to the racial obsessions that were character characteristics of Western European empires. So she challenges this view and considers that actually race operated in quite a similar way as it did in Western European empires. Uh, but still there's this consideration of Russia as post-colonial based on a self-colonial impulse in Russian history, which can be traced back to Peter the Great and his reforms, um, him opening a window to the West by building Petersburg and imposing Western norms on Russia and forcibly Europeanizing Russia. Uh, so, so what are some of the arguments that are made? Uh, for example, Dragan Kujundic um, argues that um, uh, Russian identity is post-colonial based on, on these self-colonial impulses. Also, we have Alexander Etkin, who also considers Russia an internal colony and argues that in Russia, the typical colonial endeavors were directed 
not overseas, but rather at the people in the homeland. So the issue with this application of this or self orientalist theories uh, in Russian studies is that there is a, a contest of victimhood. So there's, there's this tendency to, to compare the suffering of Russians in Russian empire uh, to the suffering of non-Russians. So for example, the heartland regions of the country were exploited more than the peripheral regions, argues Atkind. Uh, similarly, um, Geoffrey Hosking argues that, uh, talks about the subjection of virtually the whole population in the Russian empire, but especially uh, the Russians. And this is of course uh, problematic because it pits these uh, uh, categories, Russians, non-Russians, the colonizer, the colonized in the, in the context of uh, victimhood. So there's a similar argument, uh, for example, proposed by Vyacheslav Marozov in his study, Russia, a subaltern uh, empire. So um, this type of approaches, I would argue, promote, risk promoting the view of Russian empire as almost exotic. Uh, some even argue that Russian empire was very beneficial to the colonized under its rule. And so it risks promoting an image of this victim um, colonizer that was actually very kind to people under its rule and was harsher to the Russian people itself. So Moroz, what is uh, Morozov's argument? Uh, Morozov's argument is that Russia actually appropriates, assumes this identity as a victim and actively promotes it uh, on the international scene uh, and uh, promotes this image of being a victim of the West, that the West is a master that um, punishes uh, Russia. Uh, and this discourse, ironically, um, it, it uh, mimics the Russia's own discourse on its victim status. Uh, and uh, this uh, narrative of Russia's victim status has been identified by one scholar, James Wirch, who identifies these four key uh, traits, four key notions of this victim uh, narrative. So Russia is peaceful and not interfering with others. Russia is viciously and wantonly attacked without provocation. Russia almost loses everything in total defeat as the enemy attempts to destroy it as a civilization. And through heroism and exceptionalism and against all odds, Russia triumphs and succeeds in expelling the foreign enemy. So this intriguing discourse on the vulnerable self-colonizing center adds a new dimension to the classical Western model of colonialism. And it holds the potential of influencing the relations between the so-called colonizers and the colonized in significant ways. So for example, the so-called colonized who subscribe to this rhetoric, who believe in this rhetoric that Russia was a savior, might close their eyes on the more problematic elements of colonialism and put their, ho their hostility aside in, in favor of viewing the colonizer as justified in its imp imperialistic ambitions. So they might say that, the, to simplify it, Russia was justified in uh, conquer, conquering us because they protected us from the greater enemy, which is the West. Uh, and indeed, in the 1940s, we could say that the Second World War provided a perfect villain against which the various uh, Soviet nationalities could unite uh, in a common patriotic struggle. And uh, in Russia's victory over Germany, there was a powerful source of collective pride. Uh, the natural desire of identifying with the victorious power creates a psychological dichotomy in the subjected people and heightens the ambivalence of their identity definition in relation to the colonizer. And indeed, we have proof of this in the surge of Russian inflected Soviet patriotism after the Great Patriotic War, which provides one historical example of this phenomenon. Uh, 
Uh, we can consider there are many examples of such testimonies, but one example is by the author, Soviet or Armenian author, Rachio Vanessian. Uh, if we consider his remark, for example, uh, the happiest period of friendship, friendship among our people was the cruel years of the Great Patriotic War. Uh, the question of the motherland's life or death was being decided. Our peoples showed uh, how quickly they could master Russian, or to be more precise, the language of destroying the enemy. They showed how correctly and successfully they found the paths of brotherhood and how equal they were. The danger threatening the Soviet Union made them a real large and united family. So there's this idea of the foreign enemy uniting the people in the Soviet Union and thus lessening the perceived threat posed by the Russians themselves. Uh, and this is a view echoed not only in the Soviet Union, but also in the post-Soviet space. For example, uh, a Nazari author uh, says something along the similar lines. She claims, uh, Rena Yusbashi, uh, she claims, we all remember the great patriotic war. We all remember that Russia spearheaded the battle against fascism and the Russian people probably lost the most in this battle. So there, there are still very fond feelings uh, towards Russia. Uh, and again, the image of Russia as a colonizer is not as straightforward as it is in the cases of France and British imperial cases. Russia is a more ambivalent colonizer. So to sum up this first part, um, after this, there will be a 10 minute break. Uh, Russian post-colonial studies, of course, very welcome uh, since it enriches both our understanding of the post-Soviet experience and it also questions the current uh, Western model of post-colonial theory. But we have to be careful not to focus solely on the Russian perspective, to, to extend the focus to the perspective of uh, former Soviet states, especially from the Caucasus and Central Asia, which are considered the most typical colonies. And we need to move beyond this rhetoric of Russia as um, as a, a benevolent self-colonial empire uh, that it was more, that suffered more than the countries um, outside of Russia because this contest of big victimhood uh, leads us to a bottleneck um, and we will be turning in circles and that this has to be uh, transcended. And how we can transcend this is by looking at uh, literature, how authors from post-Soviet sphere uh, from the Caucasus, from Central Asia, what they have to say about the Soviet and post-Soviet experience. So when we come back after the break, this is what I uh, will be looking at, how we can employ uh, specific concepts of post-colonial theory to examine current de developments in the post-Soviet sphere. So there's a 10 minute, 10 minute break, if David would uh, agree. Yes, of course, it's up to you. <laughs> you are the master in this. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so what is the time? So we will convene, reconvene in 10 minutes, mm -hmm. whatever time is on your watches now, where, where, wherever you are. Mm -hmm. In Georgia it's 12.10. So how precisely this younger generation, how the younger generation of uh, people in the Soviet, uh, post-Soviet sphere are challenging this uh, idea of post-Soviet and they are moving beyond post-Soviet. So we'll talk about this uh, towards the end as well. Let me just share my uh, presentation. So moving uh, to part two. Uh, in the second part, I'd like to argue that turning our attention to post-Soviet culture is crucial for integrating post-colonial and Russian studies together. So let's start. Studies and just in case not all students are familiar, we'll quickly go over this concept of Orientalism. Uh, until the late 1970s, the now Orientalism had two quite particular definitions. Uh, there was an academic term, and it referred to the study of the East, usually the Near East, and Orientalism was a, quite a neutral scholarly pursuit that involved mastering some rather difficult languages, and its practitioners were quite an eccentric and rarefied bunch 
Meanwhile, to art historians, Orientalism referred to uh, a 19th century school of painters such as Eugène Delacroix, who favored Near Eastern subjects. And in both cases, the work that the scholarly operators whereby the West studies the East is a means of oppressing it. So he has quite a binary understanding of the East uh, oppressing the West. So Occidentals or Westerners do this uh, by thinking about the Orient as the other, uh, a mysterious, feminized, malevolent and dangerous cultural enemy. Perhaps no other work of late 20th century uh, cultural criticism has been as influential as Edward Said's Orientalism. It re revealed how notions of the East were largely formed by prejudiced Western imperialistic values of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, the book examines a range of 19th century French and British novelists, poets, politicians, philologists, historians, uh, and drawing on the work of Michel Foucault, Said views their writings on the Orient as a discourse by which European culture uh, managed and produced the Orient. So as I mentioned, uh, we cannot talk of postcolonial theory without going back to literature. The very source of postcolonial theory is in literature, uh, the way the East was depicted in paintings, in uh, books, in novels, uh, and Said writes that according to this uh, Orientalist discourse, the Oriental is irrational, depraved, uh, childlike, different, and so the European is by contrast rational, virtuous, mature, and normal. And this manner of representation, Said argues, was used to justify colonization even uh, before it actually took place. And we'll later look at how this idea of the civilized mission was also prevalent in the Soviet Union. So the key part of colonialism then as a result was the civilizing mission. Uh, and the civilizing mission was the cultural justification for the colonial exploitation of French, Portuguese, Brit British, German, and US colonies. According to the logic of the civilizing mission, it was the duty of all modern nations to bring, to bring the benefits of uh, more enlightened ways to the less advanced uh, brethren. The Oriental other, which was shaped by Orientalist writings and art, had to be introduced to enlightened ways, away from barbarism and backwardness. So Orientalism uh, was very much promoted by Romanticism. Romanticism was essentially a reaction against uh, uh, and the rejection of uh, what preceded it. What preceded it was rationalism and classicism that idealized the Greek or Roman past and put emphasis on order, reason, restraint, and decorum. Uh, Romanticism rejected all that and it had deep roots in German philosophical and literary trends during the 18th century. It was pioneered by a uh, Lutheran pastor uh, from Germany, uh, Herder, and the lead leading advocates included uh, Schlegel, Schelling, and uh, Goethe in his younger years. Along with others, these writers stressed the primacy of emotion, intuition, spontaneity, the mystical, and the sublime. So everything that uh, was opposite to rationalism. In rebelling against rationalism and the idealization of the Greek or Roman past, uh, the German romantics also looked to alternative sources of wisdom. And this is how they came to the East. The Orient or the East was particularly appealing uh, because the theories about Euro European languages or origins in India, for example, heightened uh, interest in Asian antiquity. At the same time, the Near East exoticism and sensuality appealed strongly to contemporary aesthetic tastes. According to Schlegel, we must seek the most sublime romanticism in the Orient. And Lord Byron's famous literary hero, Charles Harrod, who was a gentleman escaping from the elite society, did precisely that. He was alienated from his homeland and roamed the Alps, Albania, and other exotic places to overcome his crisis. Like its uh, literary counterpart, 
Orientalist in art, Orientalist painting was an offshoot of Romanticism. The Islamic Orient had intrigued European artists since at least the Renaissance. But the Near East artistic appeal uh, reached its zenith, its peak in the 19th century with the rise of Orientalism in uh, French art. Uh, predominantly, we have uh, painters such as Eugène Delacroix. Uh, some, uh, some of these paintings were faithful uh, genre paintings, but at the same time, Orientalist authors imagined scenes of excess, sexuality, violence uh, that stood in opposition to the bourgeois values of the West, and therefore they uh, presented a type of escapism for, uh, a, and breaking of taboos for the co more conservative European societies. And we have here an example, the, one of the most famous examples, the death of um, Sardinopoulos by Eugène uh, Delacroix, which represents, um, uh, which is based on Lord Byron's tragedy and represents the last Assyrian king reclining on a magnificent bed, calmly con contemplating the exec execution of his concubines and horses before his doom. So, why this brief overview then into Orientalism? Because it is, was in Russian Imperial and Soviet projects and continues to be quite prevalent. Uh, so if we turn to Soviet paintings, for, for example, uh, we see that uh, increasingly receptive to broader European literary and artistic trends, early 19th century Russian writers and artists could not fail to be influenced by Romanticism. The movement's Orientalist proclivities were no exception. Uh, among Russian painters, interest in the East in the modern age came initially from the West. Russia's Orientalist painter par excellence is probably Vasily Vereshagin, whose voyage to the Caucasus inspired him to produce numerous sketches of the region and its people. The artist's interest in exotic local customs led to a detailed account that was soon published in the popular French monthly Le Tour du Monde around the world. It was extensively illustrated, and the travelogue was full of cliches about the barbarous, menacing Orient from the filthy drink um, adult Kalmyk nomads and thieving gypsies to the audacious, coarse, and vengeful Kabardians. Despite having been pacified by the Russian army, the threat of violence was ever present in the mountains of the Caucasus driven by religious fanaticism, as Vereshagin uh, writes, and the hate common to tribes subjugated by their conquerors. Aside from the Caucasus, Vereshagin also traveled to another region uh, conquered by the Russian Empire, Central Asia, or Turkestan, as it was then known. Uh, Vereshagin's Turkestan series consisted of genre paintings and battle scenes, in addition to a few ethnographic studies. While some were imaginary, Many were based on personal experience and observation. Together, they justified to Vereshagin Russia's civilizing mission in Central Asia by invoking Orientalist tropes about despotism, cruelty, uh, and vice. Some canvases also raised disturbing questions about the conquerors themselves, so it was not as straightforward as that. But nonetheless, Vereshagin's main aim was undoubtedly to um, and, and quoting him again, uh, to describe the barbarism with which until now the entire way of life and order of Central Asia has been saturated. Vereshagin believed that Turkestan could emerge from barbarism with Russia's help and reach the same level of development as the West. Russians had the duty to bring civilization to their Asian brothers, a task best accomplished by conquest and rule, thus through violence. According to Vereshagin, Whatever the cost, and with all due respect to the law and justice, the question of colonizing Turkestan must be settled and with the least possible delay. It concerns not just Russia's future in Asia, but above all, the well being of those under our rule. In truth, they have more to gain from seeing our authority definitely established than to return to their former tyranny. Now, this is especially in. Uh, important, I think, that they have more to gain. So again, there's this idea of the colonizer as being benign and benevolent to uh, the peoples that it conquers. Moving to literature, if Central Asia served as a popular theme in Russian Orientalist art, then when it came to Russian literature, peoples of the Caucasus were the most popular subjects. 
The Russian Empire included realms so diverse as Poland and Central Asia in the 19th century, but the conquest of the Caucasus stimulated the richest body of literature and the liveliest engagement with questions of Russian cultural identity. The most notable examples are 19th century romantic novels set in the Caucasus, uh, such as Mikhail Lermontov's uh, Hero of Our Time. The explanation lies largely in uh, historical timing. The military conquest of the Caucasus, which began around 1818 with uh, General Yermolov, coincided with the rise of Russian Romanticism, a cultural phenomenon that imitated the West, as already mentioned. So uh, in addition to Romanticism, the process of empire building brought an unprecedented number of Russians to the Caucasus as civil servants, travelers, soldiers, and exilees. So given these new contacts, the Russians copied Western empires and readily uh, perceived the Caucasus as their own Orient. And they made it a major point of reference against which to clarify their own national identity. Of course, Russia historically positions itself very um, ambiguously as neither Eastern nor Western. And here we have the differences between traditional Orientalism and Russian Orientalism in that Russian Orientalism is more uh, ambiguous and complex than the Franco-British counterpart. On the one hand, by imagining the Caucasus as an Orient, Russians were boosting their claim to be European. And this phenomenon was encapsulated by the famous statement that uh, famous Russian author Dostoevsky made at the very end of his life in relation to the conquest of Central Asia. And this is what he said. In Europe, we were hangers on and slaves, but in Asia, we shall be the masters. In Europe, we were Tatars, but in Asia, we too are Europeans. Our civilizing mission in Asia will bribe our spirit and drive us thither. So I think it's pretty self-explanatory uh, that by contrast to the more barbaric Orient, Russians could boost the, uh, European, the European aspects of their identity. In other words, to build an empire in Asia was a European sort of project that boosted Russian self-perception as Europeans. But at the same time, Russia could not isolate the Orient as its other, as easily as Western Europeans could do, because Asia comprised an organic part of Russian identity itself. Asia was both self and other for Russia. Russia's hybrid semi-Asian identity found expression in the romanticizing of the North Caucasus people by authors such as Pushkin, uh, Lermontov, Pestuzhev, Maminsky, and others. These romantics did not exclusively identify with the Western civilization, and they knew that Russia did not completely belong to it. So they also enhanced Asia some way or another. You can find, for instance, the praise of North Caucasian men as brave fighters for freedom, skilled in martial virtues, characteristics that the Russians liked to associate with themselves. We also come across a praise of the breathtaking landscapes of the, and the famous beauty of women from the Caucasus. One can also find a great duality in these writings. There are hints, especially in Yermontov, of the ferocity and bestiality of the conquest. In Lermontov's poem, uh, Ismail Bey, the Russian army is referred to as Khishni Zvier, a predatory animal. The Russians are shown destroying uh, a village, murdering babies, and so on. And Lermontov was not actually the first who cast doubt on the moral legitimacy of uh, the military conquest. His motives of Russian soldiers as murderers of babies were vital precursors to the anti-imperialistic position expressed later by Tolstoy in Haji Murat, uh, where Tolstoy plainly denounced uh, Caucasian war as a genocidal aggression. So as mentioned previously, a number of seminal studies have examined this process, uh, how uh, Russia constructed its imperial identity. Uh, Sorry, someone just moved the slides again. Uh, yet the current application of post-colonial theory in Russian studies is generally limited, as I mentioned, to the study of Russian culture without um, uh, paying as attention to outside um, cultures outside of it. Uh, for example, as Harsha Ram remarks, 
Often when we look to the East, we remain content with Russian representations of it. So the time has come, I would argue, to decolonize Russian studies by paying attention to the perspectives of the former Soviet states, especially ones that were so uh, directly perceived as the Orient, the Caucasus and Central Asia. Similarly, in order to accurately understand the nature of Russo-Soviet colonialism, it is crucial to pay attention to these perspectives. And here we come then to post-Soviet literature. Since the dissolution of the Soviet Union, societies in the former republics have been negotiating the post-Soviet identities at the intersection of national, uh, Soviet, uh, and Western political dynamics. Reflection on the Soviet experience has been a key part of, the, of this process, and post-Soviet literature has actually become one of the liveliest platforms where these questions of what it means to be post-Soviet, are we post-colonial, are we neo-colonial, all these questions are uh, negotiated. So Soviet uh, Orientalism, so Orientalism did not just stop uh, under the Russian Empire. Uh, it persisted, especially when it uh, came to the notions of gender and Central Asia. We have, um, uh, we have processes such as Hujum in the 1920s, the uh, forced uh, unveiling, although it's arguable whether it was forced or not, whether some women really wanted to, uh, the forced unveiling uh, of Central Asian women called Hujum which presented Central Asians as backwards uh, uh, and uncivilized that needed to be liberated by the, the brothers. And some of these questions are reflected in uh, post-Soviet literature. But before um, getting to that, we also have Orientalism in Soviet films. Uh, we have Diga Vertov's uh, uh, three songs on Lenin, for example, where you see a Muslim woman from Central Asia whose face is completely covered, and she sings, all my life I've been blind, without light, without knowledge, a slave without chains. Uh, and then the song goes on to uh, praise Lenin and uh, to uh, show how uh, he brought, uh, where he saw darkness, he made light, turned a desert to a garden, death he turned uh, to life. So we see a very clear, a very clear example here of the Soviet civilizing rhetoric. The Soviet civilizing rhetoric and Orientalism also uh, can be traced in Soviet literature. For example, in the novel by Andrei Platonov, Jan or Soul, we have a hero who come, travels from Russia to Central Asia in order to bring the Jan nation into the communist fold. And he meets a young girl there. And at the end of the novel, he takes uh, this girl ID back to Moscow and dresses her in European clothes in order to make her more civilized. And so women of Turkmenistan, as one uh, scholar suggests, serve as a metonymic representation of Central Asia's liberation through the intervention of Soviet ideology. Uh, and similar films uh, exist even nowadays in, uh, uh, and uh, also in the Soviet uh, Union, uh, for example, Andrei Gonchalovsky's Pyarvin Chijil, first teacher, where we have a Bolshevik hero saving an illiterate Central Asian heroine. Uh, and this type of plots uh, echo what Gayatri Spivak has called the story of white men saving brown women from brown men. Now, uh, moving to the post-Soviet context, Russia's so um, in the post-Soviet market, uh, there are still persisting trends of Orientalism. So as we know, in the ninth, after the breakup of the Soviet Union, there was a massive wave of immigrants coming from uh, Central Asia and then the, the, and the Caucasus. And so nowadays in the post-Soviet market uh, in Russia, there is a great fascination to find out the peculiarities of uh, what the life of these immigrants is in Russia. So there's, there's a big taste for narratives of migrant journeys, especially by women uh, authors who tr talk about their experiences. And so there's a tendency to present their journeys of coming to Russia as uh, civilizing uh, journeys. Uh, so for example, we have an Uzbek author called Bibish, 
who, uh, whose uh, memoir, a, a dancer from Kiva, became a bestseller in uh, Russia. And she was invited to uh, all the main channels on Russian television to talk about how she left behind the barbaric ways in Central Asia and how she found freedom. And uh, we are then to question whether Bibish and authors like Bibish, who find the success, can resist being orientalized? Is there any strategies that they can use to, uh, to establish themselves as migrant women? And this is where we can employ some post-colonial theories. For example, we can look at the concept of tricksterism. Um, it mainly applies to literature, but, be, but it can be extended to wider spheres of migrant survival tactics. It's uh, basically, it's a, a way of appropriating orientalist stereotypes. So for example, if Bibish was told that she was a country bumpkin, a naive childish woman who didn't know uh, much about life and here he came to Russia and suddenly became civilized. What Bibish does in her book, in her memoir, which is called A Dancer from Hiva, what she does is that she appropriates this persona. She puts on a persona of a seemingly naive, innocent fool, which is similar to Russian uh, character, folk stock character, Ivan the Fool. Uh, and why Ivan the Fool? Because he's immediately recognizable to Russians. So it's a cultural reference that she uses. And she pre presents herself in this manner through comic anecdotes by self-deprecating comments such as, oh, silly me, uh, how foolish of me. Uh, here I am a country pup pumpkin in Russia. But at the same time, when the mask of this trickster uh, falls, uh, we see that Bibish naivety is only superficial, so she is uh, a trickster. Uh, for example, in the moments where the mask of a trickster slips, um, Bibish then uh, critiques uh, the more oppressive elements of Soviet colonialism. So she doesn't only present Russia as a place where she found freedom, but she actually is uh, uh, more critical. Uh, in a chapter on Soviet cotton farming, for example, uh, we see that Uzbek people and women in particular were forced into exploitative cotton farming, uh, which was a monoculture that also destroyed the environment, most notably contributing to the disappearance of the Aral Sea. Uh, the author recounts how she and her mother worked for long hours in extreme conditions under uh, bullies um, uh, in reward of dismal or no payment at all in order to fulfill the high demands set by the center, Moscow. While offering frank accounts of her difficult experiences, Bibish's literary persona escapes any type of self-victimization, whether in relation to the Soviet or post-Soviet, or indeed her local national systems. In maintaining her integrity, she resists joining the cultural establishment that propagates stereotypes of the oppressed, of the victim migrant. The persona of a trickster, quintessentially liminal by nature, becomes especially useful in this regard as it emphasizes Bibish's refusal to labor, uh, label her national belonging in clear terms within the binary schema of the Russian colonizer versus Central Asian colonized or the local male oppressor versus the local female oppressed. So these are very subtle tactics that this author in this uh, example employs to escape these narratives. Uh, another key concern that we come across in post-Soviet literature, so literature as a platform of coming to terms with what it means to be post-Soviet is the question of neocolonialism. And here we have the, uh, the theme of NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations that are at the heart of neocolonialism. So the tone of irony that I mentioned with Bibish uh, and her uh, trickster fool, Ivan the Fool character, this tone of irony is even more explicit in the narratives of NGOs by women authors, especially. Why women authors? Because uh, women actually make up the uh, predominant section of NGOs um, nowadays in the post-Soviet sphere. And they give us really unique insights into the workings of the NGOs by recounting uh, their experiences in this satirical and often hilarious uh, novels. For example, we have 
uh, Kazakh author Lilia Kalaus, who herself uh, worked in Soros Foundation Kazakhstan uh, NGO. And she wrote this book, The Fund of Last Hope, a postcolonial novel, as a way of satirizing how post Soviet societies are uh, in the throes of not only uh, Russian and national, but also Western interests and how they navigate uh, these very ambiguous uh, terrains. Uh, while NGOs and neocolonialism are among the key concerns of postcolonial theory, it is very, very surprising that very few critics, uh, one or two even, have uh, uh, examine how NGOs are represented in literature. And here we're not talking about the post-Soviet sphere, we're actually talking about the wider post-colonial uh, literature. Uh, when approaching the Russophone NGO narratives by writers like Kalaus, the concept by Akil and Bebe, the concept of mockery from within, uh, proves particularly useful. So Bebe recognizes the ongoing effects of colonialism but he highlights the importance of refocusing our analytical attention to the daily rituals by which post-colonial people negotiate the effects in their everyday lives. So it's about this, again, this little acts of resistance of neocolonialism. So blurring the oppressor and oppressed binaries, Bebe focuses on the potential complicity between the neocolonial forces the corrupt elites and their subjects. So he actually exposes that uh, all these forces are serving the same goal. He adds that considering this interdependence between these various parties, the main, if not the only means of resistance to these forces of oppressive power is to expose them from within through laughter and mockery, even while ironically embracing them. So, uh, Kalaus is a great example of that because she, like I mentioned, worked in an NGO herself. And so she uses her insights to mock this organization from within. Uh, and this is how Russo for Women authors, not just Kalaus, but also others who have similar experiences, highlight the colonial dependency and complicity with Russia in the West and the ensuing self orientalizing effects of post Soviet identity constructions. So she highlights the, the similarities that actually it's not as binary as the West competing with Russia, but that actually it is all interdependent. And finally, uh, we come to the utopian narrative. So um, as I mentioned, uh, that I would come to, at the final uh, part of my talk to this question of what it means to be post-Soviet that is completely, um, treated in a very original way by the newer generation of authors, um, especially uh, in Central Asia, these trends are the most striking. So what happens in Central Asia is that uh, the activists, uh, and here we have uh, an activist organization, Stab, for example, who identified themselves as queer uh, communist, queer communist feminists. Uh, they published this collection of stories called Holy Others. Uh, and what they do is they build on post-colonial notions of uh, post-humanism, notably basing their ideas on the theorist Donna Haraway. And they create utopian worlds outside of uh, Earth, where they imagine the type of uh, place that they would probably want the post-Soviet space to be. Uh, why? Because the reality that surrounds them, uh, th they're not happy with at all. Uh, of course, as we discussed uh, previously, the trends of uh, religious fundamentalism that are so typical of post-colonial states are um, also the case in countries like Georgia, uh, and they are also the case in Central Asia, where every time there is a march, um, or for example, the 8th March for the International Rights of Women, um, uh, probably uh, there is not as dance to hold uh, uh, um, pro uh, LGBTQ plus rallies, but even such uh, neutral uh, rallies such as uh, Women's March is always uh, accompanied by uh, violence. And so literature then again serves as a platform for activism, you could call it, of imagining this alternative post-Soviet selfhood and uh, engaging with uh, post-colonial theory.
Uh, I can go into much detail here, but I'm writing a book about all these topics uh, for Oxford University Press. So, and also there is an article uh, theories, theorizing Russian postcolonial studies, where I discuss uh, at greater length this methodological issues of applying postcolonial theory in Russian studies, uh, which you could consult. Uh, so to, to, to conclude then, uh, I would suggest that the time has come to ask not whether postcolonial theory is applicable to the Russo-Soviet case, and uh, I have argued that in many significant aspects it is, but rather what is there to be given.